Anyway, let me just uh, open it up to, to the questions. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your views on unemployment insurance and if the structure of our economy and the workforce are changing, you know, how cyclical and structural unemployment um, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's an, there's an economic truism that you're going to get more of what you subsidize, you're going to get less of what you tax. I mean, if you pay people not to work, people are going to take you up on it. You know, I mean, I did it myself. I remember the one time in my life I collected unemployment benefits. I did not look for a job until I exhausted my benefits. You know, I was in my 20s, and I was living in Southern California, and the weather was great, and I liked the beach, and I liked that better than working. And if I could get paid for lying on the beach, as long as I got enough money for gas and booze, I was, you know, it's fine with me. And there are a lot of people today that do the same thing. I mean, it's not wrong, it's human nature. And if you can collect unemployment for two years, man, that's a, that's a lot of time on the beach. And, you know, people forget that leisure has value. I mean, you know, people would rather not work, right? People save up so they can retire. Well, you can retire early now on unemployment. And a lot of people say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, it's only $300 a week or $350 a week. Well, true, yeah. I mean, if somebody offered an unemployed person, you know, a $100,000 a year job, they'd probably take it. But what if, what if the only job they're offered is $400 a week or $500 a week? Most people won't take it. They'd rather have unemployment because it's, it's like a huge tax on getting a job. It's a, the, the highest marginal tax bracket is faced by someone who's collecting unemployment. Because not only does he have to pay taxes on what he earns, he loses all of his unemployment benefits. So the tax rate is enormous. And of course, what people forget is when you get a job, you don't get to keep all of your income. There's a lot of expenses that the IRS won't let you deduct. You know, what if the job that you get offered is, an, is you know, 45 minutes away from your house? What's it gonna cost you in gas money to get there and back? You know, and, and maybe you have to eat in a restaurant. Maybe you have to wear a suit. Maybe you have to go to a, get, you know, have a dry cleaner. Maybe you have a kid. What if you have to put your kid in daycare? How much is that gonna cost? So it's so much easier just not to work. And, and so the more lucrative we make it, the more people aren't going to work. And I, I've talked to plenty of people, small businessmen, who've told me they can't find people to work. And if they find anybody, they're only willing to work if you pay them under the table. Why? Because they don't want to give up their unemployment benefits. There are people in my family right now that have told me, in my family, that are collecting unemployment. That's, what, that's their job. They don't want, you know. And you know, when I did it, when I had to do it, I actually had to go down to an unemployment office and pretend I was looking for work. And I remember. <laughs> I used to actually go, because I was afraid, you know, that the government might catch me. So I actually went and met with, I, I dropped off some resumes. I remember walking and, and, and making a little log so I could at least look like I was looking for a job. But I didn't want one. I just wanted the unemployment benefits. But I at least had to pretend that I was looking. Today, you don't even have to do that. You don't, have to, you don't even have to look someone in the eye and lie. You do it all online. You can, just, you can just be in South America collecting those unemployment benefits, you know, because they go a lot further. If you go down to, like, you know, Costa Rica, because the, 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 the money goes a lot further if you're lying on a beach down there. So, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is a racket. But, you know, yeah, the politicians love it because the unemployed, yeah, extend those benefits because they'll vote for whoever extends them. And, of course, part of the problem, you know, and then that's where, you know, you've got all these illegal immigrants coming in. It's because who's going to take these jobs if they can get unemployment benefits? So, we, I mean, we shouldn't even have uh, mandated unemployment insurance. I mean, if somebody wants unemployment insurance, let them buy it. I mean, you buy car insurance, you buy health insurance, you buy fire insurance. If you want to buy insurance against losing your job, just go out and buy it in the private sector. It'd be there if the government didn't provide, and at least then it would make more sense. You'd have markets setting premiums, and it, you know, people, people who wanted it could buy it, and, you know, and it, have, it would have different incentives. It would probably pay off in a lump sum. If you lost your job, you know. But now we give people all kinds of incentives uh, not to work. And of course, we pass laws that make it illegal for people to work. Right? The dumbest law probably we've passed is the minimum wage law. But co everybody in Congress loves it because they can pretend, oh, it's terrible. Nobody should have to work for $5 an hour, so let's make the minimum wage, you know, whatever it is, $7.50. All right, well, what does that mean? That means if you're not worth $7.50, it's illegal for you to get a job. And it's not just 750. Actually, you have to cover all your payroll taxes, uh, you know, other fees, mandates, and of course, 
there's a lot of legal liability that comes with being an employer. So an employer has to assign that value because the minute you hire somebody, there's a million ways you can be fined or sued. If the government doesn't like the way you're hiring people, they'll sue you. They don't like the way they're firing people, you can be sued. All kinds, of, so it's very risky. The government has made it very risky to hire somebody, so a lot of people make a rational decision not to hire people or to hire as few people as possible. Or if you've got to hire somebody, hire them in another country. We don't have all these liabilities. So, you know, if we got rid of that minimum wage law and we also got rid of all these unemployment benefits, a lot more Americans would have jobs. You know, how could it be? I mean, look at all the stuff that we're importing. Yet we have all these unemployed people. You know, what are the statistics? I, it's just ridiculous. We import 90% of our seafood. 90% of it. We're surrounded by oceans. We've got all these lakes. And we've got all these unemployed people. You don't think they can fish? I mean, you don't even just pick up a rod. Go out there. But why aren't they doing it? They don't have to. Right? So we've got to get rid of all these rules and regulations that are... Um, making it illegal for people to work, that are making it expensive to hire people. Because people forget where jobs come from. Right? I hired a lot of people. Why did I do that? Is it because I'm a humanitarian and I just want to create jobs? No, I want, to get, I want to make as much money as possible. And I figure I can make more money if I hire people. That's the, only, that's the reason jobs are there, because somebody wanted to make money. And they hired somebody to make money. But the more difficult the government makes it, the more expensive the government makes it to hire people, the less likely it is that somebody is going to do it. I mean, if I'm going to hire people and I'm going to lose money, obviously I'm not going to do it. You know? So you have to have more profit, more opportunity. And of course, you know, the other thing that you need is, a, is capital. I mean, I can't hire workers if I don't have any tools to give them, if I don't have any equipment to give them. Where's that all coming from? That comes from savings, it comes from underinvestment, from underconsumption. Uh, you know, when they, they, the, uh, the government keeps talking about we have to raise taxes. We have to raise taxes on the wealthy because they're, they're, they're not the ones that are spending money. If we just raise taxes on the wealthy, they'll just have less money to save. Yeah, which means they have less money to invest, which means they create fewer jobs. We have, you know, a, a lower standard of living. So if, if the politicians that are, that are saying we need more jobs, if they really understood where jobs come from, they would, they would understand that they need to reduce the regulations and reduce the taxes on the people that create those jobs. Yeah. One argument that I've heard over and over again about a gold standard is there's not enough gold for all the money that we've printed. Do you have a rebuttal to that? Well, not at this price there's not. The gold price is just going to have to go up, that's all. But the idea that there's not enough gold in the world is ludicrous. It doesn't matter how much gold there is. Uh, it, prices are just going to adjust to the, to the level of gold that, that exists. Money needs to be scarce. That's what makes it valuable. If it was plentiful, if there was, if there was all the gold that we needed, then it would have no value. What makes it rare and valuable is that it's scarce. And if you look at historically, the gold supply increases by maybe 1 or 2% a year. That's it. That's pretty predictable, pretty consistent. And it works great. I mean, we had the Industrial Revolution on a gold standard. People that say the economy can't grow on a gold standard, our economy grew more on a gold standard than since we left it. If you look at the standard of living of the average American from, let's say, um, 1800 to 1900, and compare the way the average American lived and the way he lived at the end of that century, and then compare that to the changes that have made since we've been on the fiat standard, it's a much bigger difference. You know, the standard of living grew a lot faster. And imagine how much wealthier society would be, how much less we would all be working, how much more prosperity and leisure we would all enjoy if we had continued on the gold standard for the 20th century. Instead, we went off it and we sacrificed a lot of economic growth in the process. Yeah. Um, if, if you operate on the assumption Yeah, well, you know, eventually it just has to happen just because the numbers are so large. Uh, you know, we, we've got, you know, just like the people who were buying houses using a, a teaser rate on the subprime mortgage, the problem was the teaser rates expired and, you know, they couldn't afford the higher payments. Well, we've got the same thing. I think 
about 40% of the national debt matures in the next year. That's a lot of money. I mean, that's, what, $6 trillion, I don't know the exact amount, but it's two to three times what the government collects in taxes. How can we possibly pay that off? Well, we can't. And the idea is that we don't have to because we're just going to borrow the money. Well, that's the same idea that Bernie Madoff had. And it worked for a while for Bernie, but it didn't work forever. You know, we're not going to be able to constantly roll this debt over, not at, you know, near 0% interest. Eventually, our creditors are going to want to get paid, and we can't pay. And, and then we're, going to, you know, we're not going to have the crisis until it's, until it's forced on. We're not going to do the right thing until there's a crisis, right? So we're not going to preempt it. But we had this phony crisis when we had the debt ceiling crisis, when we refused to raise the debt ceiling. The real crisis is when the lenders won't, won't, won't raise the lending ceiling. And in fact, we actually admitted to our creditors, you know, the mess of, you know, how much trouble they're in, because we said, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to default. That's what we told them. We told them that we're running a Ponzi scheme. We didn't say that if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to raise taxes so we can pay our debt, or we're going to cut Social Security spending or military spending so that we can honor our commitments. We said, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we can't borrow more money. We're not going to pay off the people that we borrowed money from. So we told the, you know, we told our creditors that they're the little man on the totem pole. So they already know this. But at some point, they're not going to be buying this debt. The Chinese are going to wake up. They're going to stop buying this. I mean, people think that the Chinese are, are going to throw good money after bad indefinitely. That you know they've got two trillion in treasuries, and that's they can't afford to lose. So they're going to keep buying. Well, pretty soon they're not going to be thinking about the two trillion they have but the five or 10 trillion that they're gonna buy if they don't stop. And, and you know, might as well lose money on two trillion than lose money on 10. So at some point they're gonna wake up and you know, and, and, and of course their economy is gonna boom. The minute they stop doing this, that's the biggest irony is you have American politicians beating up on China for manipulating their currency. But the, beneficiaries, the, the benefactors of that policy are not the Chinese, it's the Americans. We get to buy stuff for cheap. We, get to, we have all this stuff that the Chinese are sacrificing. If the RMB went up, the Chinese would be buying all this stuff, not us. They would get to have the fruits of their labor instead of just the labor, you know, and we, and, and we get the fruits. Now, long term, the Chinese aren't doing us a favor because they're helping to undermine our economy. But in the short run, you know, we have a higher standard of living because it's financed on the backs of people in China working in factories and, and, and not getting the full benefit of what they produce. But the, where the crisis is going to come, we can't borrow any more money. And the Federal Reserve has to print. They have to do QE3 or QE4, whatever they're calling it at the time, or maybe they won't call it anything. They'll just do it. But, and then prices really start to rise much faster. I mean, I know prices are rising for food, for energy. Look, I just got my, my health insurance premiums from last year, and then my initial increase was 19%. Now, I had to shop it around to get my increase down to 12%, but that's just in one year for the same coverage. You know, but it's not. It's how it's college tuitions are going up. I mean, prices are going up. I mean, the only place that they're not going up is in the CPI. I wish I could buy the CPI, but unfortunately, I have to buy real things, and and they're getting more expensive. But at some point, they're going to get a lot more expensive, and the government's not going to be able to pretend it doesn't exist. And you know, the dollar is just going to collapse. I mean, Europe is. You know, right now, Europe is temporarily buying us some time, but it's going to be very expensive time. Uh, because it's enabling us to go deeper and deeper into debt. But again, where is this debt going? It's going to finance more government. The government bubble is worse than the housing bubble. It's worse than the dot-com bubble. Because at least in the dot-com bubble, we got a couple of companies that had value. At least the housing bubble, we got houses. We might have spent too much money on them, but they're there. You know, the crazy thing is guys like Alan Greenspan argued for burning them. He wanted to destroy them so we, would have, so we would have no benefit whatsoever from the housing bubble. At least we got houses, right? But there's, what are we getting from the government bubble? We get anything, you know, more bureaucrats. I mean, we're getting more consumption, more spending. So this is the biggest bubble of them all. And it is going to unravel. And, you know, the question is, what's going to happen? When the dollar really starts to collapse and prices start spiraling out of control, what are we going to do? Are we going to do what Nixon did? Are we going to put on wage and price controls? We probably won't need wage controls because wages probably won't be going up. That's the one price that probably won't rise. But the price of everything else is going to go up, which is going to be particularly problematic. You know, a lot of economists, they make the, 
the incorrect assumption that you can't have inflation without rising wages. Well, yeah, you can. It's just a lot more painful when the wages don't go up. Uh, but employment costs go up. Maybe not wages, but other costs associated with employment. But people working, you know, doesn't create inflation. In fact, people working helps bring prices down. It's people not working that help make prices go up. Because prices are a function not just of, of demand, but of supply. And people working create supply. Right? When they're not working, you have less supply. And also what happens is when the dollar crashes, right, supply of goods in America goes down because we can't import to, afford to import. In addition, we export less. So what happens is capacity comes down. But you can see that now in the airlines. Right? The airlines are raising prices even though fewer people are flying. How are they doing that? Because they're reducing capacity. And they're going to have to reduce it a lot more. And air prices are going to rise dramatically in the, few, in the next few years, even though fewer people are going to fly. Fewer people are going to fly, but they're going to play, pay a lot more. Same thing is going to happen. We're starting to export uh, more refined gasoline now. That's more and more of that's going to happen. So even though Americans are going to be using less gas, they're going to pay a lot more for the gas they use. Because the supply is going to be less. Because a lot of the gas that used to be here is going to be filling up a car in China. And that's going to be even more dramatic once the Chinese RMB goes up. You know, once the Chinese let their currency go up, everything goes on sale in China. So the Chinese buy more of everything. Well, where are they getting all this stuff? It's the stuff that we used to buy, but that we can't afford anymore. Because when the prices go down for the Chinese, they go up for Americans. So this, this whole collapse is coming. And if we want to do anything about it, we have to recognize right, what, what, the, what the fault is. And then we have to start dealing with the real cause of the problem, which is the big government, all the regulations, all the taxes, all the spending. And we can't just talk about cutting taxes. We can't cut spending. That's the tax. Right? The cost of government is measured by what it spends, not what it taxes. Because it, all government spending has to be paid for, one way or another. And either they're going to pay for it through taxation or through inflation. Now, temporarily, they can borrow. But that either means they're going to have to raise taxes in the future or raise inflation in the future. So ultimately, they can either tax or inflate. But that's it. So that's the cost. So when people talk about, hey, we'll cut your taxes, but they have these huge deficits, they haven't cut our taxes at all. Right? If government is more expensive, right, we're paying more to support it, one way or another. The politicians can lie about it right, when, they, when they run a deficit. But ultimately, we're going to have to pay. So we're going to have to shrink that government dramatically if we're ever going to get out from under this mess. Because the only reason this phony economy works now is because we can borrow the money to sustain it. Because the world will take our paper for their stuff. But when that stops, America, we can't function. This economy cannot function with this level of bureaucracy. You know, we're, going to have to, we're going to have to make some deep-rooted changes. And they're obviously going to have to come from, from this, you know, here. Yeah. Uh, kind of a two-part question. Uh, first, um, it's good that the Austrian school is starting to get more attention nowadays, but for a long time uh, it was more in the public view, mm -hmm. uh, a sort of intellectual battle between Keynesians and the mm -hmm. Chicago school. So uh, what do you say to the suggestion that um, the Chicago school uh, could be very, very dangerous because they essentially preach free market except when it comes to currency and debt. And then when something goes wrong, the Keynesians say, well, look, the free market doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, it's a bad, you know, it's, it's a bad comparison, you know, say, you know, you, know you, you give capitalism a bad name when you preach it, but don't really practice it. That's, that's what happened. I think that, you know, you really have to start to look at the Austrians who, you know, have a much better explanation for what's happened and a much better understanding. But, you know, the problem is, and the reason that Keynesianism is so popular, you know, here on the Hill, is it's exactly what the politicians want. The Keynes gives them a reason to do what they want to do anyway. To just, you know, because it's so easy to just spend government money. And if, and if you can argue that that's going to grow the economy. And of course, you know, where you can often, you know, destroy their arguments. Like, they're, they're saying we have to extend unemployment benefits because it's going to help the economy. And how is it going to help the economy? They say, well, because the unemployed people are going to spend the money. Well, if just printing up money and giving it to people to spend grew the economy, why just limit it to the unemployed? Why not give the benefits to everybody? Then we'd have even more growth. And, if, and, if, and, if, and if, why not double the unemployment benefits? Then we'll get double the growth. Why not triple them, quadruple them? You know, why not give everybody a million dollars? You know, and, and of course, at some point, they're going to say, well, that's too much. Well, then what about if we do a dollar less? Is that too much? 
So you, it, it never works. Because whatever money the government gives the unemployed, it has to take it from someplace else. The government has nothing. All it does is redistribute. And so it's not going to help the economy. It's going to hurt the economy. You know, a, apart from the fact that it's, it's subsidizing people not to work, and so the economy is deprived of the labor and the output that otherwise would have accompanied that work. Instead, somebody is idle. But when you transfer money around, you're, you're, you're lessening economic growth. The deficits that we create to pay those unemployment benefits are going to do more damage to the economy than whatever benefit you get from spending those unemployment checks. No. So it's, it's, it's easy to, to, to critique that, but the, the, the Keynesian view is the more politically popular. And that is the problem. Everything that we need to do, all the things that are good for the economy, are bad politics. And everything that's, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, bad for the economy is good politics. No. Even among a lot of the people who understand that government is a problem, you know, it's still, a lot of them still you know, want their Social Security benefits. They, they want a lot of stuff from government. And they don't realize that the government doesn't have the money. Yeah. I think we, we've gone over time, so I don't want to keep people here who, who need to go. But if there are more questions that want to be, that you want to ask, please feel free to stay. All right. So <clears throat> when this, uh, this collapse does occur, is there any country around the world that will fare better? Or how will America fare relative to other companies? Yeah, I think the, the countries that have the most to gain are the countries that are bearing the lion's share of the burden of supporting us. So if you look at the countries that are amassing enormous foreign exchange reserves, particularly in dollars, countries that have these huge sovereign wealth funds, these are the countries that have the most to gain because they are you know, paying the lion's share of the subsidy. This is what America gets a huge subsidy. A lot of people will be able to conceive that Americans live beyond their means. Right? We, we buy a lot of things uh, that we didn't produce. We, we borrow and we spend. So we live beyond our means. Well, that's only possible because other people are content to live beneath their means. Well, the people who have been living beneath their means, when they don't do that anymore, they're going to see a big gain. And so, you know, when let's say the Chinese, for example, when they allow their currency to rise. All of a sudden, uh, the Chinese are going to be able to afford to buy a lot of things that today are out of their price range. And so the Chinese are going to see a big increase in their standard of living. At the same time, we're going to see a corresponding decline in ours because now you know, we're not going to have those things. And if an American wants to buy something made in China, maybe he's going to have to pay three or four or five times as much money. You know? And then as an in individual, is there anything you can do to lessen the blow for yourself? In well, yeah. I mean, as an individual, you can recognize that the dollar is going to lose value, and so you don't save dollars. And that's part of the problem, right? You know, we need savings to grow the economy, yet but you'd have to be a fool to save dollars. So therefore, we can't get the savings that we need if we're chasing capital out of the country. But you can buy gold, you can buy silver, you can, you can invest overseas, you can have foreign currencies, you can have stocks abroad in the economies that are going to improve when you know, this dollar at the center of the global monetary system comes to an end. You know, this is the problem. We, we have polluted the entire global economy. We export our bad monetary policy because the dollar is the reserve currency. Everybody is trying to maintain a parity, a relationship with the dollar, but instead of being a force for good and stability, we're a force for instability and, and, and recklessness because it's a race to the bottom, right? And, uh, and so it's disrupting the entire global economy. We are the, at the epicenter of these massive global imbalances that are the real root cause of the problems and the booms and the busts. But you know, when that ends, you know, the world you know, collectively can breathe a sigh of relief. But it's going to be very difficult in America uh, to get used to actually having to live within our means, because then we're going to have to acknowledge how dramatically our means has been diminished over the years. And as I said earlier, if we're going to restore our, you know, you know, our economy, we can't do it with all this government. I and mean, we never could have produced the wealth that we once had if we had all this government. And it's the absence of government that allows us to be productive. It's, it's freedom. That's what we need. If we, want to, if we want to help people, we need to give them more opportunity and more freedom. And we're not going to get that by, by passing laws. Right? We get that by repealing laws. Yeah. Uh, I thought you just raised your hand. Oh, was you? Yeah. Um, I have a question about convertibility because sort of the American history textbook explanation for us leaving the gold standard was that other countries, particularly France,
plants converted on mass are dead into gold. Um, can the United States, if we go through sort of a more organized default rather than letting the market, you know, tear us apart, um, be the only economy that switches back to gold standard if, if there's that risk of convertibility? If, if the dollar skyrockets, how will we export? Well, just the, well, the way we exported before. I mean, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean if you have a strong currency, it doesn't mean you can't export. In fact, if you have a strong currency, it diminishes your capital costs. You have more savings. You have more investment. It diminishes your uh, raw material costs. It makes imported components less expensive. It means you don't have to give uh, wages because your workers are getting wages just in, in, in higher purchasing power. They don't need a, a nominal increase. So uh, there are a lot of benefits. But yeah, I mean, if we were to be proactive and admit right now, okay, the country is broke and let's restructure on our own terms. Let's figure out, you know, you know what we have to do. Because I said, we need higher interest rates, right? That is the, the only way we're gonna solve the problem. But we have to acknowledge that if we, give in, if we let interest rates go up, you know, this whole phony thing collapses, which of course is a good thing because the sooner it collapses, the sooner we can rebuild something real in its place. But everybody is so afraid of the short-term consequences that they want to postpone it as long as possible, which means it's not going to be on our own terms. It's going to be a, a, a crisis that hits us from abroad. If we do it ourselves, if we preempt, it's still going to be painful, but it's not going to be as painful. And we'll, it, it'll, it'll be a lot better. And of course, a lot of the pain, it's not going to be uniform. The pain is going to be felt principally on the people who are living off of government. The people who are getting a check from the government are going to have to get smaller checks, or in some cases, no checks at all. We're going to remove the burden off the backs of the American public. So it's not, when I talk about austerity, okay, austerity for who? Right? Not the people paying the bills, the people living, you know, the people riding in the wagon are going to have to have some austerity. Not the people pulling it, they're going to get some relief, which is what they need. But you know, some of the things that we could do as far as getting government out of the way will have such immediate benefits, right? If we got the government out of education and out of student loans, tuitions would plummet. All of a sudden, college wouldn't be a, such an insurmountable expense. Families wouldn't have to worry about saving for college because it wouldn't be that expensive. And maybe not all their kids would go. I mean, now everybody goes to college even if you have no aptitude for it whatsoever. What's the point? What's the point of sending a kid to college so we can you know, party it up for five years, get drunk, you know, and then graduate, you know, with a lot of debt and, you know, no skills, no knowledge. Um, if we get government out of health care and, you know, all of a sudden medical costs collapse, I mean, isn't that going to be a good thing if it doesn't cost so much to go to the doctor? It doesn't cost so much if you get sick. So there are a lot of things that you just get government out of the way and you get free market efficiencies in. You get an immediate benefit. Now, who does that hurt? Well, yes, someone's going to hurt. When tuition has come down, some overpaid administrators at universities are going to earn less money. Oh, well. You know, and some people working in universities are going to lose their jobs. Okay, well, they didn't need those jobs. So they'll have to do something productive. And if they do something productive, we're all going to benefit. You know, the more people employed productively, everybody benefits from that productivity. The more people that we have doing things that they shouldn't be doing because of some government subsidy, we're all made poor as a result. So it's not going to take that long. If we do all the right things, it's like ripping off a band-aid. If you just rip it off, it doesn't really hurt that much. You know? But if you peel it off slowly, you know, then it hurts. So if we just get rid of all this government and, and, and bring back freedom, it's, we're not, there's not going to be a lot of suffering that long. Some people, sure. You know, people who, who thought they were going to retire on Social Security, okay, well, they're going to find out that that's not going to happen. They got to work. They got to save their money. But they're not going to get Social Security anyway. So why don't we, you know, let's let's deal with that now instead of paying them off in worthless money. I mean, what good is that going to be? Because that's the end result. But the, the, not only don't the politicians have the integrity to do the right thing, most of them don't even know what the right thing is. Right? So hopefully if we can educate people, there's got to be somebody in Congress other than Ron Paul, right, that actually cares about the country. And, 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 you know, a lot of times when the congressmen will think, well, I can't do that. I mean, it's too big of a risk. Well, what's the risk? That you don't get reelected? I mean, what's so terrible about that? You know, there are people that, are, that risk their lives on a battlefield for the country. You can't risk not getting reelected? I mean, big deal. So people have to understand, you know. And this is, you know, this is a very pivotal point in our history.